Hey, welcome to this video of how to set up a seahorse tank. Now, um, I've done loads of videos about my reef tanks and uh, coral fragging and what have you, but I don't think a lot of people knew I actually used to keep seahorses. I had like a little bit of success breeding them. Um, but I wanted to do a video starting from scratch of how to set up what I was gonna try and make the most perfect seahorse tank. Um, and they are, it's really similar to keeping all marine life animals, but with um, seahorses there are a few differences and um, there's quite a few different things you need to consider when keeping seahorses and firstly I'm going to start talking about the tank and the tank that you're going to need. So let's just have a little look. So this is the tank I've gone with. Um, it's taken me a while to actually get the tank because I was looking for a second hand one and the reason I've gone with this tank it's a Red Sea Max C250 um, and the reason that I have gone with this tank is because these tanks are made a lot taller than the newer ones so they're actually 22 inches tall and it's 36 inches wide and seahorses really require that extra height You've got to imagine if you have sand or a sump tank with an overflow, you can actually lose an inch at the top and almost two inches at the bottom. So even if you're getting like a 20, 22 inch tank, you're actually really only got with about 19 inches of water. Whereas these tanks have the sump in the back of the tank, which means that the water level is a lot higher. So you're actually making full use of the 22 inches of the water column. Okay, so the first thing that you need to know is that seahorses for the first pair require a minimum uh, water volume of 130 litres and then another 40 litres per additional pair of seahorses. Also, as I mentioned, they require a much taller tank because it needs to be three times their body height so that they can perform their dance in the morning because they'll do this um, mating dance in the morning and they need to be able to uh, wind their bodies three times around the length of the tank. Um, so obviously depending on the species of seahorse you get will depend on the actual height. Um, it's suggested a minimum of 18 inches um, but you know taller is better. But also you need to consider that although a three foot tank might look amazing, you've got to get your arm to the bottom of it to do your maintenance. So somewhere sort of around the middle between 22 and 24 inches or like two foot, um, it, it, I think is quite nice because you can actually get to the bottom of the tank and clean it. That's why I think this one's perfect because it's 22 inches tall um, and the water actually goes to the, the full height of the tank because it just goes around the back. Okay, so this tank, holds approximately 250 litres. You need to also account for water displacement. So that's things like your rock, your decorations, if you're putting sand in and things like this, also any other uh, biological filtration you're gonna put in. So you need to take off uh, the displacement. So I reckon that's gonna be about 40 litres, give or take. So that takes us down to about 210 litres. So you've got 130 litres for your first pair, then you've got another 40 litres for your second pair, and another 40 litres for your third pair. So that takes us in total to 210 litres, and then your water displacement of 40 litres for all of your rock and your filtration methods. So that means that this tank can happily house six seahorses, um, and that should be quite comfortable. Seahorses are filthy. That is the one thing I'm gonna say. They make so much mess. Um, so I would not run a tank without one of these, which is a protein skimmer. They come in all different shapes and sizes. Because the filtration of this tank is all down the back here, this has a skimmer, which is in the back compartment here. We've got a heater. Um, I'll come to that in a second. You've also got some mechanical filtration in the form of sponges and what have you. Um, as you can see, these ones all need a bit more of a clean. Um, but this is a second-hand tank, so just gives you a little idea of what I'm going to be doing. So, 
Yeah, so you've got mechanical filtration. So the main form of mechanical filtration is gonna be your skimmer. That's gonna take out um, a lot of the protein from inside the tank um, that you can't see and siphon out. You've also got these big sponges here, which are gonna allow beneficial bacteria to grow on them. They're also gonna filter out any larger particles. Um, also, there'll be a layer of filter floss on the top here, which will pick up any smaller particles. Um, you can use filter socks, you can use all sorts of different things. Then you have a media basket here, and that's gonna contain um, such things as uh, activated carbon, which can help clear the water, maybe phosphate remover, you know, it's really dealer's choice in that sort of uh, situation. Um, also, uh, we've got another filter over here as well to collect different bits, another sponge. So to recap, because seahorses are so messy, you'll need some good mechanical filtration in the form of sponges, filter socks, pre-filter media, and a good skimmer. So mechanical filtration is going to be your first uh, line of defence against ammonia and nitrate because it's going to pick everything out before it gets a chance to break down. I'm now going to talk biological filtration and I'm going to be using dry rock. So this was once upon a time live rock uh, from the ocean and I have cleaned it and dried it, I've gone through it. I've made sure that there's um, no pests. I've um, made sure there's no sharp edges. I've gone over it with my hands. I've made sure that it doesn't feel rough to the touch. Um, I've opted uh, for a few shapes here to make something quite tall in the tank. And this rock is gonna harvest our live nitrifying bacteria, which is gonna what's, it's gonna give us our cycle, which is gonna make the salt water habitable for the seahorses. I'm also adding bags of ceramic media uh, these ceramic noodles, uh, which are really high porous, um, and they are another home for your nitrifying bacteria to live on. Now, it's not always recommended to use sand as your substrate in a seahorse tank, because seahorses are so um, mucky, if you're gonna be in there siphoning out their food that they don't eat or their, um, their waste every day, um, sometimes sand can actually um, hinder this because food can get trapped. So if you are gonna use sand, make sure that you use a really fine, soft sand and that it's only a very, very small layer. But the benefits of having sand in the tank is it's going to increase your, uh, your biological filter because even sand will hold the beneficial bacteria as well. And because I'm relying on a slightly less of a rock uh, biological filtration, um, I'm going to add the sand as well to help with that. Um, but I'm only going to add a very, very thin layer so that I can see if there's uh, leftover food and what have you. Um, so yeah, so a very, very fine layer of sand if you're going to use sand. Okay, let's recap. Biological filtration is going to be living on your porous media. That's going to be in the rock and any kind of ceramic media that you want that's appropriate for salt water. This is where your good bacteria, your tank needs to sustain life is going to live. Sand can also help, but it's much easier to deal with if kept shallow and fine. Okay, so now you've got your rocks in and you've secured them with any kind of putty or super glue. Um, I've gone for some quite tall structures here because it's a tall tank so I can fit more rock in. It's time to wash your sand for your sand bed. I'm gonna be using this eco sand. Basically everything, including my rock, I'm doing dry because seahorses are really, really susceptible to pests like Aptasia or Hydros or all sorts of different things. So you don't wanna give them the opportunity to get in the tank. So starting off with dry rock, dry sand, and everything means that your tank's gonna be you know, as pest free as possible. Okay, so now I've added sand. 
that's um, a little bit more biological filtration. It looks better, in my opinion, to have sand in the tank. Um, but you can see I've kept it really, really, really shallow. The reason for this is I don't want to take away any of the vertical swimming space for the seahorse. Um, and it's also a lot easier to clean when it's nice and shallow. Also using this really, really very, very fine soft sand as well, um, because it's denser, so uh, less stuff can get trapped in it. All right, now I need to just talk to you about water. Obviously seahorses are marine fish, so they live in salt water. I only recommend getting tank bred, tank raised seahorses. So I would only recommend that they be put in synthetic seawater. So that's one that you make up yourself using RODI water and then your brand of salt mix that you uh, mix up according to the uh, the instructions on the packet. I have a RODI machine attached to my sink so I can fill this tank now with RO water. Um, because this is the first time this tank is being filled, I can mix the salt in the tank. So that makes it quite handy as I know there's gonna be roughly around 210 liters of water going into this tank. I can easily do that calculation and see what amount of salt needs to be added. So a quick water recap. Seahorses are marine animals, so they're going to need a good, clean source of marine salt water. I achieved this with RODI water and a synthetic salt, which is added. This is the mixing guide to the salt that I use. So I just weigh out the correct amount of salt for the amount of water that it's going to be mixed with. And because this is the first time setting the tank up, I can just add it directly to the tank to the freshly made RODI water and I can just pour it all in and let the pumps run. It's now 48 hours later. So the salt is completely dissolved. The tank's looking really clear. So now what we need to do is we need to test that it's got up to temperature and we need to test our salinity. So now it comes time to test the specific gravity of your tank. I want to aim for between 1.020 and 1.022. Um, this is on the lower end um, because this is going to be a fish, well a seahorse only tank. Um, it's good to aim for the slightly lower end purely because um, pests and things find it a little bit harder to survive in the lower range salinity. You've got two things that you can use to test this. This is a hydrometer, which is quite easy to read, but then you've also got a refractometer, which is a little bit more specific. You can see this one comes in at 1.021. Focus on. Okay, you can see this one comes on at 1.021 um, and then you can double check with a refractometer. There's a little look in there. Now it's really important with seahorse tanks that they're actually kept at a slightly lower temperature. You want to keep it below 25 round about between 22 to 24 degrees. The reason for this is it just slows everything down so um, any kind of bad bacteria in the tank doesn't get a chance to take hold. Um, seahorses are really susceptible to bacterial infections so keeping the temperature just slightly on the lower side makes a massive difference. This tank also came with T5 lighting which is not really ideal as it gives off a lot of heat so I'm actually changing that out for LED strips. Another little thing I've added is this aquarium heating and cooling controller. So you can add a fan and you can add your heater and it keeps it at the perfect temperature. So if it's too hot, the fan comes on. If it's too cold, the heater comes on. We now need to address the evaporation from your tank. Your tank will only evaporate fresh water, so you need a way to constantly replace this. It's not too much of a big deal in a seahorse tank because you will be doing regular water changes and you can address the salinity changes that way. But a really good way is to just add an auto top up and this will keep your water stable. 
This is what I'm going to use. This is a 25 litre bucket, which is going to hold my RODI water. And then I'm using the Tunzi Osmolator as my auto top up. There we go, and it's just magnetized into the back of the tank there. So there's got, if the water's too high, if the water's too low, and then it just tops the water back up. And it's just returned by this black tube here. And let's talk about lighting quickly. So lighting a seahorse aquarium doesn't require um, lots of intense light. It only requires enough so that you can see the seahorses and they can see their food. The best thing is just to do teeth, um, is to do LED lights because they keep the temperature of the water a lot cooler. But if you are going to put things like macros or soft corals in the tank as well, you will need to have a light that is suitable for the growth of them. Um, this tank actually has built in T5 lighting, as you can see there. Um, I may use that for a couple of hours a day because I am planning on putting some macros in. But I'm just going to monitor the temperature of the water. This um, light that I have at the back here is supposed to be able to grow plants anyway, so it should be fine for macros. But it actually like changes colour and does all sorts of weird and wonderful things if you play around with the controller and you can get it to do sort of fairly weird and wonderful things but obviously this would not be great for the seahorses but we can just keep it on a nice steady one but you can um, turn it down and you can also increase the brightness as well so it's quite handy to have something with a little bit of controllability. It's now time to cycle the aquarium, so I'm going to do this using Dr. Tim's one and only live nitrifying bacteria. And um, this is going to start our cycle because I've used all dry and uh, dry rock, dry sand. So there's nothing but any beneficial bacteria on there at the moment. So I need to add this to start the cycle. This can take anywhere from two to six weeks. Um, it will need a food source, so I'm going to be adding this ammonium to the tank as well you just followed the directions um you need uh basically one uh one milliliter per liter um so five mils is equal to 100 drops i'm going to need 200 drops i'm going to need 10 mils of this um but i'm going to add the bacteria first i'm going to give it a couple of hours to let it settle make sure your protein skimmers any uv lamps you've got in all turned off just so it can settle into any of your porous media and then you need to feed the bacteria with this ammonium this means that you're not having to add anything any food that could potentially have um uh, you know other nasties on it as well and you're not having to sort of rot anything in the tank um, You will need some test kits, but we'll cover that in a minute. So first of all, we just need to add our Nitrifying bacteria. I've already added some to the other filters anyway, so I can just pour the rest of the Bottle in there I've gone for the biggest bottle. Well, I think the biggest bottle they can do but this one um, treats 454 litres I've only got 200 litres of water, but you can't have enough of this stuff. So, you know, more, more is better when it comes to nitrifying bacteria. So we're going to leave that now to mix up in the tank. And then we're going to add some ammonia and we'll go and talk about testing it. So it's been a little while now. It's time to add um, 10 mils of ammonia to the tank water. So I'm just going to do that now. And there we go. Now hopefully we should see an ammonia spike. So now you've added your ammonia to the tank, give it 24 hours and then you can start testing. Um, you can use any test bottles you want. These are really popular. As you can see, these are actually out of date, but they're just an example because I am using this. Um, this little device here uh, is a monitor. So it's a, fish, uh, it's a tank monitor and it will monitor the, um, the 
free floating ammonia inside the tank which is harmful to fish but also this beneficial bacteria needs to feed on it's also going to monitor your ph and your temperature as well this is an extremely handy bit of kit to have on a seahorse tank because they really cannot handle ammonia spikes at all even high nitrate so this allows me to just keep that little bit of 24 hour monitoring on it you have to change the slides inside it so you don't have to calibrate it at all you just buy a new slide you get packs of three so you get like 90 days worth so it's kind of a subscription really but not any different than buying test kits and then having to monitor it manually um, obviously it only does your ammonia your ph and your temperature but it's very handy to keep a good eye on your temperature obviously being that you're wanting to keep it on the lower side but it's also good to keep an eye on your ph as well because that can generally tell you if things are you know taking a bit of a turn in the tank so yeah a really useful bit of kit to have just to monitor everything and then it saves you having to do the manual uh, ammonia tests which could get quite annoying if you had to do that every day. So this does it automatically for you. And just to show you quickly, after adding the ammonia, I've actually already had an ammonia alarm come up on my Senai, which means that this is taking really good readings. So this is the first time I've used this to actually cycle an aquarium. So it's really interesting to see the actual biology in the tank happening in real time. So yeah, amazing. It's a really good idea to um, continuously test the tank though, so it's quite a good idea to do manual testing as well um, and not just rely on one form. So just to recap, to cycle your aquarium and I recommend a fishless cycle, you're going to need some bacteria and some ammonia. Um, Dr. Tim's one and only is really easy to follow. There's lots of stuff on the internet that you can find out um, and you can find out precise measurements of the amount of ammonia to use. Other things that I suggest that you get in supplied or supplied with before you uh, bring home or have delivered your seahorses Turkey bases are always really handy. Use a different one for different tanks. I've spoken about cross-contamination. You really don't want to mix things up because you do not want anything from any of your other tanks getting in. If you've just got one tank, then just something for a quarantine tank. Um, these little things are quite handy to defrost frozen food in. Keep the same one that you use just for the, you know, don't cross contaminate basically. Um, this is a very handy thing to keep if you're keeping seahorses. It's, um, I think in America they call it formalin. Um, it's a very, very handy thing to have if you are planning on breeding your seahorses like I am. Um, we'll go into different uh, anti sort of parasitic treatments. This, um, yeah, this is just a handy medication to have if there's anything going on that shouldn't be. And it's just handy to have things like this close to hand uh, because there's nothing worse than receiving your seahorses and then on the second day, maybe them having something wrong, then you can't get anywhere to treat them, especially at the moment because things you have to wait for them to be delivered. Um, you've got some uh primer fix as well which i think is an antifungus which i've just picked up anyway yeah treats fungal infections it can be used on saltwater fish as well so that's just handy to have um this is um an antibiotic for fish as well um furin 2 it's not available in the UK so I have to purchase this and someone sends it to me from America don't know if that's really allowed but um, it's not it's not good to have um, it's not good to not have an antibiotic or something close to hand because seahorses are, they just seem to be very difficult to get hold of at the moment so the last thing you want to do is uh, not have any medication to be able to treat them if something's wrong and um, when i used to breed them i have had a few situations where i've had to treat them and they've responded really well to medication um the problem is that the exotic vets around here won't accept um skype or zoom calls and um 
you have to euthanize a seahorse to, to find out what's wrong with it and I wasn't prepared to do that so I found alternative ways to get medication. Um, this is another Diamox which is used for, um, they can have this uh, bloating of their pouch where they can float to the top. Um, if the water quality is not great, I had a couple of seahorses actually die from it, so um, I had to get hold of some of this. So it's very handy to have this to hand because it took me a long time to find it. So the fact that I've got it to hand, um, yeah, it's just, it, I think it's just really good to be prepared, basically. You don't have to have all of these medications, other things will do. Um, but just be prepared, you know, especially if you're like me and you're wanting to breed them. Also, um, coral dip this i've used to clean the tank with as well and i also used i dipped my uh, the rock with it before i'd let it dry out when i was cleaning the rock up so that it was making it safe for the seahorses um, i've got another uh, test kits there which aren't really the best they're just strip ones just for a quick look um, and then I've got more filter floss and other little things there. Also, I've got a brand new um, glass scraper. I find these stainless steel ones the best because you put the, um, the actual blade and you can throw the blade away. Obviously, after time, they do tend to, I mean, they're stainless steel, but they do tend to rust. But again, no cross contamination. So it has its own uh, little scraper. And then my box of salt, which is my um, salt that I use for this tank, which is just it's not a reef salt basically, so it doesn't have too many other additives in it. Um, and I think, yeah, that's good. I have a funnel, which is sometimes handy, so I don't throw water everywhere. And I think that's us. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about an optional extra. So you've gone to the extent of using dry rock, dry sand, you're doing a fish to cycle, you don't wanna introduce any pests because seahorses are very delicate. Now, it might be a good idea to set up a quarantine tank or an observation tank because my tank is gonna hopefully hold six to eight seahorses. Now, I would ideally like to get them from two different sources so that they're not related. So a good thing to do is to, at the same time, set up a quarantine tank because you can quarantine the seahorses from one source in the main display tank and then you can keep an eye on them, the other set, in a quarantine tank. Now, this doesn't need to be anything special because it's not a long-term solution. Um, I'm gonna use it more of an observation and treat if necessary. Um, you set up exactly the same way. You've got your biological filtration, which is this dry rock rubble, which I've just used in there. And this just has a little filter which I've got some of these ceramic rings that you saw before underneath here, and then just some filter media there. And it's just circulating the tank with the same salt water, this little feeding hatch thing there as well. Um, and you can probably notice that I've actually already got some macro algaes in here, which I am uh, observing and quarantining and so they will not be going into the display tank until well until it's ready until I feel that there's uh, nothing wrong with them I've given them a good shake there doesn't seem they're quite small as well so this is a bonus of, of getting very small pieces is that you can really make sure that there's no pests on them um, but you will have to use completely different uh, like utensils for keeping a quarantine tank. So you can see this one's got a greenish uh, top. So I know that this one's for this tank and then I have a white one for the main tank and then I have different ones for all my tanks so that nothing gets cross contaminated. Um, so this is gonna cycle alongside the other tank, but I'm probably gonna do more water changes and things. Um, now, yes, macroalgaes, they will need some nutrients in the tank, but I'm actually gonna be supplying them through a uh, sort of a bottled formula, and um, I'm gonna be feeding a small amount of food to this tank, just so that it breaks down so there is some phosphate and nitrate in the water. Um, but this is just a quarantine tank. Macroalgaes are not as sensitive with things like coral or actual fish. So I really want to just keep an eye on these for a few uh, few weeks till the main tank is cycled and then 
I will be adding them to the main display tank and setting it up from the beginning. Um, by all accounts, macro algaes aren't affected too badly by ammonia spikes, but you know, I don't want them decaying or breaking down in the main display tank. And sometimes these are quite hard to get hold of. So I probably do have them a little bit sooner than necessary, but if I keep an eye on them in here, at least if they do break down, they break down in here and not in the main display tank. Right, so we're five weeks in now, and what I've done with my chalk pen is I've just kept an eye on everything I've been testing. Um, and so now we're currently at zero ammonia at 0 0.05 NO2 and five parts per million NO3. So we're coming to the end of the cycle now, and you can see that as well. You know, we're growing a small amount of algae, um, there's some um, diatoms as well, there's a little bit of fuzzy algae there um, and that there's a little bit of diatoms on there so these are all to be expected when cycling a new aquarium um, we're five weeks in now so I'm probably gonna add my uh, macros that I've had in quarantine I'm gonna add those uh, at this stage because if it can grow algae on the rocks then it should be able to sustain algae in the tank and that should eat up the last little bits of nitrate um, and phosphate and what have you and hopefully outcompete this uh, brown and green rock algae um, it you know won't do that completely I did put a little a tiny uh, little test one here um, and he's been there for a couple of days and he seems to be doing okay. I will now, uh, once I've got these algae in, have to start feeding this tank, but I've got some liquid um, feed that will hopefully just keep these going. I've also got a couple of snails that I have bred in my other tanks that I've had in the quarantine tank. These tiny little snails, which are quite good algae eaters. So I'm gonna add those now as well. So this is five weeks later. So here's a little look at the, uh, <laughs> these are the snails that I'm going to be putting in there. These guys have just been in quarantine um, and now I've just got to get these macros out and then attach them. And just to give you a little idea of how good these guys are, um, they do reproduce very quickly. I think he's actually laying eggs in the observation tank now. Um, so it just goes to show that, um, yeah, they, they're obviously quite happy, so uh, they'll be great little additions to the seahorse tank. So here's a little look at the uh, algae that I've got. I've got a couple of uh, little snails here. I'm not quite sure what size, what type they are, but they seem to only eat sort of algae. I've got a lovely little red branching one. I've got another kind of one they actually seem to have grown a little bit they were very very small when i got them i did buy them as a, as tiny little ones um i you know i was aware that i was getting really small ones these are from um i think it's called live algae it's um it's re really quite hard to get hold of in the uk uh, all the different varieties of them it was the best sort of online place that i could find um, i really like this one here um but yeah, and the beauty of having such small pieces is you can see if there is any pests. I think there's even like this little bit of Cheeto or Chado, whatever you want to call it, in there as well. Um, there's another little snail under there. But I've been watching these. I've been feeding them. Nothing's come out. There's no Aptasia on them. I know they're really clean um, and safe to add to the tank. Um, and, you know, let's see how they go. They might thrive or they might melt away um, it is very early to be adding them but my theory is that if I add them now they should hopefully being I guess slightly more uh, slightly more what's the word I'm looking for being a kind of bigger life form or a slightly more progressed uh, they should out compete sort of hair algaes uh, and anything else for all the nutrients that I want taken up in the tank and help clean it and also they make it look nice and I want to give them the best chance as well and all I use to fix them is this uh, <laughs> sea chems reef glue um, you can just literally pop it on the 
end of a little bit of algae and then you can put it into your rock. Um, this one here will just sit at the bottom, maybe try and get it into a nook or a cranny um, and obviously just pop the snails onto where I want them to eat and have them wander around the tank. So I'm just going to do that now. There's just a little bit of glue there and I'm aiming just to pop it in there. There you go, as easy as that. So the macros have now been added. It'll be interesting to see how they fare. There's one there, there's one here. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see how they do. Um, like I say, there is obviously the right conditions to grow algae these are slightly more complex little life forms so they may need other bits and bobs I am obviously now going to have to start feeding the tank um, only a very 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 minor amount I know that there's phosphate I know that there's nitrate and you know we know that that's the things that algae likes so there should be the right things in here and we know that it's pretty much cycled there's um you know it's almost there so i say probably another couple of weeks um i'm going to be adding oh well, i'm going to be doing a water change next um so it'll be interesting you know i think it's important to sort of whilst you're waiting for your seahorses you're going to need to keep doing water changes you're going to need to keep on top of your water quality this is a very minimal start to the ugly phase. I expect these rocks to be fully covered in, um, you know, green algae and diatoms and everything. I mean, they're still looking pretty clean. Um, so that's why I wanted to introduce these now so that they can take up the majority of the phosphate and nitrate and um, the pollutants in the tank. But obviously there's gonna be some organics that are gonna be bound up in these rocks as well, which is gonna leach out into the tank. Um, and it could completely overtake and, you know, it could wipe out these algae. They might, you know, become completely futile. So. We'll see how it goes. And again, we need to monitor. So we can be relatively sure that there's no pests or anything on these because you know they've been sitting in my observation or quarantine tank for the last five weeks anyway. So hopefully the next time you see them, they're all gonna be uh, thriving, but we'll see. I just wanna show you, look at these guys. They are always my first canary in the cave because I mean they're they're probably very very hardy they seem to survive quite well and they breed readily as well you do end up finding them in your pumps and what have you um, but they're absolutely great on little tiny algaes and different things like that what I also wanted to mention was I have also added some copepods as well um, from my culture so I know that there's a nice clean culture of copepods gone in there um, and they're going to help with um, hopefully sort of eating this kind of algae off the rocks just so that it doesn't get to play proportions it is going to grow but we don't want it to, to become too unsightly and long so you do have to keep an eye on it at this stage um, and I reckon we're probably going to be ready for um, for a nice big water change in about a week's time so now my, I know my cycle is pretty much done, um, probably sort of a couple of weeks before it's perfect. I'm now adding stability every day. So I'm doing this every day for seven days. Um, and now because I've got macros in the tank, I'm gonna add this as well, just so that um, they've got everything that they need. And I'm adding a very, very small amount of food as well to the tank. Um, but I'm, I'm literally only doing that once a week, just you know, just to make sure that there's there's something in there for the snails because it's all dry sand. So here we are, seven weeks down the line, um, just doing some manual testing. So you can see we've got zero ammonia, 
we've got zero nitrite, and then we've got some signs of nitrate, which means that we've got a full cycle. We've got ammonia being converted all the way down the line and then to this, um, which is uh, non-toxic in small doses. And we remove this with water changes, but around sort of 10 parts per million is, is, is okay really for the tank. Um, in fact, you need this if you're going to be having uh, macros and corals because they will need something in there to feed on, um, along with PO4, but I'm not going to get into that just yet. So this is the beginning, and today is very exciting because today I'm going to pick up my seahorses. So um, they are tank raised, tank bred, and they've come from the Tropical Marine Centre. I actually went to the Tropical Marine Centre, I think about a year ago, I was invited to have a look around at how they... Um, treat and bring in all their animals from around the world and all of the sort of the home breeding projects they've been doing and the sustainability really interesting video i'll link it in the description uh, actually i'll see if i can put a little link to it in this part and so yes yeah, so today's very exciting i'm going to go and get my first seahorses you can see i've added a uv sterilizer it's an internal uv sterilizer um, these are great for these tanks because they only have a sump at the back you need to have something that you can put inside um, I think there are some smaller ones you can get to fit in the chambers so I might look into that but um, I'm gonna see how they cope with the extra flow from this uh, there's nothing that they can get their tails caught in so I'll see how they go keep a good eye on them and because I'm getting my seahorses today, they're going to need a place to hitch. So I use these, which are plastic barrier chains. You can get them off of eBay. I'm sure they sell them in uh, lots of places, but since we can't go to any places, eBay is always the, always a good one. Um, I'll stick a little affiliate link in the description um, and show you where I get mine. And all you have to do is they're made of plastic, so you can just give them a little wash. Um, you can cut them easily with scissors and you get them to the length that you want. And then this is just a suction cup for air line. And it's really handy because they just clip to the bottom. Not that easy doing it one handed, but there you go. They just stick onto the bottom like that. And then you can suction them to the bottom of the tank. And because they're plastic, they float. Um, it's a good idea to get some nice bright coloured ones because the seahorses will pick their favourite one and hopefully you'll get them to blend in. So you like yellow, if you're gonna get yellow seahorses, uh, red for the darker ones, and it just helps their colours come out. Uh, they do like to mimic their surroundings, which is, you know, part of the fascination that they can change their colour. So don't expect to buy a black seahorse and it to stay black, and also don't expect to buy a yellow seahorse. And, Think that it stays yellow because they do mingle with their surroundings and because i'm getting these seahorses today it's really important to be prepared that they may not eat straight away so i'm just preparing this old sweet jar it's a glass jar with um some freshly mixed up salt water with some enrichment which is just a spirulina phytoplankton mix and i'm going to get hopefully some brine shrimp and some mysis shrimp that i can enrich just on the off chance that they're not eating um because it's important just to get them eating we can always wean them back onto frozen food if they are not feeding but the most important thing is to make sure that they're they're getting the nutrition because seahorses do need a lot of feeding um, but this is just a just in case measure if they are feeding well on the frozen food that would be great um, and then these will just be like a little well almost like a little treat for them so it's just handy just on the off chance that they're not feeding just to make sure you've got some live food in and you've really got to make sure that you enrich the live food because otherwise it's going to be pretty useless to them so you want to try and make sure you're getting as much nutrient into them as possible here we go, so I've just added all of the chains and I'm just about to go and pick up the seahorses. Right, so here we go. We have two um, fus fusus, I can't say it, seahorses, fresh from, uh, from the pet shop, all looking very well. This one's actually been looking for food. I think she's picked off a couple of things that are on this uh, macro that they are uh, there on you can see her she's desperate to get out um and he's flirting up to her you can't really 
see, which is all good signs. They're looking very active, even in the bag. So what I'm doing now is I'm just temperature acclimating them, just getting them to the same temperature as my tank. I've tested the salinity of what's in the bag compared to the salinity of my tank, and it pretty much matches bang on at, I think it was 1.022. Um, which is a nice uh, range for seahorses. Um, I also picked up a few little peppermint shrimp um, and they're really good just in case any pest does get in any sort of aptasias. They do uh, eat them and they're a great addition to the cleanup crew so rather than just having snails in there they're just something else and they can potentially breed so they're a free form of live food as well so that's quite nice to have so i'm just going to get these guys temperature acclimated so it's going to take probably around about 15 minutes or so and uh, i've dimmed the lights so hopefully we've got nothing poking in their face to annoy them and then i'm going to slowly start acclimatizing them to my tank water Bad man. Okay, so what I'm going to do is with my turkey baster, I'm just going to start introducing a little bit of water at a time just so they get used to my tank parameters. I'm probably going to put three full turkey baster full, and then I'm going to give it five minutes and I'm going to replace the process. Okay, so now they've been acclimating for about 40 minutes. The water is the same. Um, it's time to put them in. I'm just going to open this up. It's a bit easier. So with a very clean hand, you want to make sure you get it nice and wet from the tank water. I'm going to go in. And you just want to... There you go. Almost let them wrap themselves around. And then very quickly into the tank. And there's one. Now we're gonna do the girl. She's on this nice macro. I might see if I can just get rid of this. I really want to keep this macro so. We're going to put that into my quarantine tank. There you go, she's around my finger. Oh, she's got quite a grip. There we go. And there you go, she's going to let go. Perfect. See how she's doing in that flow. Loving it. We've lost the other one. There we go. Okay, so we're gonna try and feed these seahorses for the first time. I'm using gamma radiated mysis shrimp. This is much better because it doesn't degrade in the tank as quick. Um, I've just cut a cube in half and I'm gonna defrost it under some tap water. Um, it's perfectly fine to defrost it into tap water. And I'm just gonna broadcast feed it and see if they take any. I think this is what really makes the difference when purchasing seahorses is making sure that they come from a reliable source and they've been tank raised and raised on frozen food. These guys fed within the first five minutes of being in the tank, which is just awesome. Uh, you can see the girl, she's definitely interested in the food and the guy, bless him, he's, uh, he's already taken a few bites. I've had these seahorses now for a good seven weeks and I've actually introduced a second pair as well um, and they're doing really really well um, I'm hoping that they're going to breed for me soon you can see we're getting a lot of flirting a lot of color changing and they seem really happy
And then hopefully my next update can be raising seahorse fry. Um, it does take them a little bit of practice. These guys are only juveniles, so um, they, they have been practicing quite a lot. So um, I am expecting to get fry from these guys, but um, yeah, it can take time. But once they start breeding, uh, it be two weeks. So like I say, I hope to come back with regular updates on these guys. If you like these videos, like, share, comment, subscribe. Um, I do lots of videos, so yeah, check them out. And um, I will keep you updated on their progress. Cheers for watching.